You're on the mound here at Fenway Park, which you did many times in your career, and how on top of you is that big green monster? It's intimidating. I mean, when you go out to the mound and you turn around and look behind you, it almost feels like when you take the ball out of your hand, you're going to drag your knuckles on that wall <laughs> as it goes towards home plate. Now, that's obviously not that close, but it is very intimidating, and it can get in your head the first couple of times you pitch here. But then in the day, you got to go do your job. But it's such a unique ballpark. I mean, you look at the green monster. It's 37 feet tall. If you look down the left field line, it's 310 down the left field line. And, of course, that is the Fisk pole now after his famous home run he hit in 1975 World series and down the right field line it's 296 where Cedric Mullen's been a ball around his first home run yesterday that's Pesky's pole but what's unique about this park is if you belly out just a little bit and go like 30 feet off of Pesky's pole it drops all the way to 380 feet so the, the dimensions of this ballpark are really unique it's a really cool place and when you think about the history here right I mean it's the oldest ballpark in all of Major League Baseball and what always got me when I stepped on this field was thinking about the players that came before me I mean Ty Cobb played here Babe Ruth played here Lou Gary played here, DiMaggio. I mean, all the greatest of the greats played here in this ballpark, and I think that's one reason what makes it so special. The greatest hitter to ever live, I think. Ted Williams played left field here and obviously dominated in that batter's box behind us. Could you use the big wall to your advantage, even though it is you get some cheap home runs from right-handed hitters? For me, it was give and take. You know, some of the home runs, you know, would get out of normal ballparks would be the line drive shots that got out. Obviously, it's not getting out here with the wall being 37 feet tall. So that saves you here uh, in some ways. But you do lose some home runs on routine fly balls. It would be outs in most ballparks. It can trickle over the monster. It's really weird. When I used to pitch, I used to think about with a runner at second base, if I'm going to give up a base hit, I wanted to give it up to the left fielder because I knew it was so short out there. The left fielder had a real shot of throwing the runner out from second base. So you try to, if you got good command that day, to kind of, okay, if they're going to get a hit, I want to hit them to the right spot and we've got a chance to throw somebody out at home plate. Let's get a look. Adley Rutschman is in the cage right now. It has looked a lot better these last few yes. days, Ben. He had a huge hit last night late in the game with the bases loaded. What have you liked about Adley these last few games? A couple things. One thing is, you know, when, when Rutsch started getting in a little bit of trouble, he was expanding the zone up. Like, they were attacking him at the top part of the strike zone and when they got ahead, they were attacking him just above the top part of the strike zone. He has started to lay off those pitches the last couple days. They've got ahead of him and they've tried to attack him up there and he's not offering at those balls. I think that's the first thing he has to fix. The second thing I've noticed is using the backside of the field. You go to game one here at Fenway Park, he hit three balls hard to the backside of the field. Two of them were base hits. And again, his hit yesterday went to the backside of the field. So what does that tell me? He's letting that ball travel. He's letting it get a little bit deeper so he can recognize what it is. And then he's attacking it to the backside of the field. So the last two days has looked really like the Adley Rutschman of the first half of the season and all of last year as well. So do you think that's a conscious effort these last few days to try and go backside? 100%. And if you look at O'Hearn, who is struggling a little bit too, you know, he's in the cage or in this group right here. And if you'll notice, he's had four fly balls hit the left field in two games in this series. That tells me, too, that he's trying to let it travel, trying to let it get deep. Because, you know, when you start to struggle, you get out in front of the ball a little bit, right? You get a little bit out in front, you roll over a lot of balls. So they're letting it try to get deeper where they can attack and hit it the other way. So we're looking at Ryan O'Hearn in the cage right now. He just hit one off the wall in dead center. Uh, that one is ripped into right field and uh, bouncing. It would be a ground rule double in a game. And for Ryan, he says he just feels kind of out of whack right yeah. now. But over the course of six months, that's going to happen. No doubt. I mean, look, there's nobody that goes through this game. When you play 162 games and you're at it for six months, everybody's going to have a little rough time. You know, unfortunately for the Orioles, a lot of the rough times happen, you know, a lot of guys at the same time. I mean, Mullins has been really hot, obviously. Henderson has gotten it going as of late. But I do like, and Brandon Hyde talked a lot about this after the last series, that we got to shorten our strokes with two strikes. We got to find ways to put balls and play a little bit more. I have seen a conscious effort as a group for this bunch in the first two games to try to shorten up with two strikes and hit the ball the other way so just put balls in play and I think they're trying to do that and I love the approach last night I thought it was really good for the Orioles they came up with five runs on 10 hits last night which was a good night Cedric Mullins not in this group hitting right now but he's gotten going these last few days really in a time of need he may not have a 30-30 season again but he could do 20-30 yep. this year which is pretty spectacular I mean, what can you say about Seth? I mean, you go back since the All-Star break, think about this. Cedric Mullins, when you talk about Oriole leaders, leads the Orioles in batting average. He leads the Orioles in OPS. He leads the Orioles in own base percentage. And he's second in slugging since the All-Star break. Brandon Hyde, take him, move him to the front part of the lineup. He's riding his two hot hands, which has been Gunnar Henderson and Cedric Mullins, and it's paid off. I mean, Mullins last night, two home runs for the fifth time in his career. The, the previous four came in that 21 season when he went 30-30. Uh, you know, but Cedric Mullins, has just been flat out awesome. I love his approach right now. I love what he's doing. And, of course, let's not forget about the play he made on defense as well.
Yeah, not many can get to that ball, lay out, and make that play. Probably right. saved inside the park home run in that moment. No doubt. I mean, look, I mean, 10% catch probability, and he got to it pretty easy. It wasn't super easy, but he got to it pretty easily. So Cedric Mullins has been a difference maker for the Orioles, especially since the second half of the season. Let's talk pitching. Big Al last night. Mm. You talk about a guy who stepped up when his teammates really needed him to. That's what we've seen time and time again this year from Albert Suarez. I mean, when we talk about most valuable Oriole, Albert Suarez is in the conversation. I mean, obviously, Gunnar Henderson's there. Corbin Burns is there for sure. But you talk about Albert Suarez, too, because here's a guy we picked up in September this time last year, not knowing who he was. Nobody really knew who he was. when he. I didn't know who he was when he got the spring training. But remember that start he had in spring training over in Clearwater against the Phillies when he went through their A lineup and punched out a lot of guys in spring training. He Should we ask Skip got, how he's feeling? Skip. How are you feeling? Hundred, like a million bucks. Skip, <laughs> you feeling all right? I feel great. You? Were we on TV? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're on TV right there. Yeah, yeah I'm feeling good. All right, good. How are you, how you guys feeling? Oh, we're good. You workout know. was good today. You feel better after workout? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I got way better shape. I got way better. Hey, what is that? We got to start somewhere. He's looking this guy's great. an animal in the gym, boat. I know. I, I, seen, I didn't see you in there. I ran, buddy. I ran today. Ran. Thank you, Roger. He ran. You saw me getting ready to run. That's not fair. I did a couple miles. It's not today. fair, but it's accurate. It is accurate. <laughs> All right, last one. Dean Kramer on the bump tonight. Uh, the competitiveness for him to post up in his last outing. Yeah, I mean, when he got hit by that 103-mile-per-hour line driving the welt we saw come up on his wrist, I think initially I thought it was broken. And then we found out it wasn't broken. I said, there's no way he makes his next start. Well, he answered the bell just six days later, went out and twirled a gym against the Rays. And so he gutted it out. He needed to go do it for the Orioles. He was outstanding. So what is this? Uh, four of his last five starts have been quality starts now. And so Dean Kramer's pitching the ball well when they need him to.